What's up, everybody? How's everybody doing today? Welcome to church. You guys look absolutely incredible. Bundled up. Anybody else like cold? Man, I love the cold. Bring it on. We get one more little weekend and week, something, however much we're getting. I love it. I think it's absolutely awesome. If you've been with us for the last couple of months, we've been in a series called The Way of a Disciple. Now, I know some of you may be new. You may be a guest today. Um, So you're kind of coming in toward the tail end of this series. I don't have a ton of time to kind of go back and recap. I'm gonna try to bring you up to speed a little bit. Um, But we've got this weekend and then we're gonna wrap it up next weekend. And so I just wanna encourage you to lean in. Um, And I do have a lot today. I keep joking, I have a message and a half. Um, So I do have a lot today that I'm I'm gonna try to get through. And I think it's really, really important. We've got a lot of work to do. Um, So I'm I'm, I'm kind of challenging you to lean in a little bit um, and kind of open up your heart and be ready to hear because I think God not only wants to share something with us today, but I think there's a challenge. I mean, this whole series has really been about God challenging, Holy Spirit challenge our paradigm of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You know, it's really about the difference between this cultural idea of quote unquote Christian versus what we look at whenever we see these first century disciples of Jesus. There's a very big difference between the two. And so we're asking, what does it look like for us to be a disciple of Jesus Christ today? Not just a Christian that's, you know, prayed a prayer and kind of believes the bare minimum and just shows up every now and then and kind of tries to be a good person, but what does it actually mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? And in and kind of the, the ancient world, they would talk like this. They would say, what does it look like for someone to be covered in the dust of their rabbi?" In other words, following Jesus, following our rabbi so closely that the dust that kicks up from his feet covers our lives, much like your car is covered in pollen. (laughs) Much like your car has been yellow for the last month, that's the mental picture of a disciple of Jesus being covered in the dust of his feet because we're just so close, right, that our life ends up looking different sounding different, we talk different, we live different, we look like everything about us begins to change, not just a few decisions that we make, but our whole life begins to change. And we've, dis- we've defined what a disciple is, and I've been asking you to remember this and hang on to it, and maybe by the end of this thing you will, but I'm gonna give it to you one more time. A disciple is one who finds, follows, and becomes like Jesus. Right, and kind of our cultural idea, we kind of stop at find, A lot of Christians that we know, you know, in our world, in our kind of Western civilization, the U.S., our world, they they kind of stop with find. I have found him and now I'm good. But a disciple does so much more than that. A disciple is being transformed into Christ's likeness and we're living that out in the world everywhere that we go. Okay, so today what I wanna do is kind of a jumping off point is we're gonna go straight to Matthew 22. We're gonna read a very, very familiar passage and then from there we'll jump in. Matthew 22, starting in verse 35, it says this, one of them, an expert in religious law, speaking about the Pharisees, tried to trap Jesus with this question. They said, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. My guess is most of us are pretty familiar with this verse. This is something that we've we've talked about as a church, the church, Big C Church, quite a bit. But what I want you to understand from from the top today is that this is not a list of what we're to do. I think often we look at this as a checklist. Oh, I'm gonna love God with all my mind, all my heart. It's kind of this checklist versus actually seeing this the way it's meant to be seen is who you are becoming. In other words, our love and affection for Jesus eventually is supposed to permeate our mind, our will, our emotions, our strength, everything that we do. This is who we are becoming over time as we grow, as we are transformed. We are becoming this. A great question to ask yourself is this, do I have affection in my heart for Jesus Christ? I mean, just stop and think about that for a second. Is there actually, in, deep in my life, is there actual love for Jesus? Or am I just living according to some moral code? 
Or am I just living according to some moral pattern that was set up you know, by my parents or my family or because I grew up in kind of the social norms of the South and the Bible Belt? Am I just trying to choose right more than I choose wrong because it's the right thing to do? Am I just coming to church because it's what I know I'm supposed to do? Or do I actually have a growing love in my life for Jesus Christ? That's a big question says a lot about your status or where you sit with him, whether or not you've truly surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. Because Jesus says, when this happens, when you are becoming this, the natural outflow of your life is that you're gonna love the people around you. The natural kind of overflow of a life that is growing in affection for Jesus Christ is that your life is gonna impact the lives of the people around you. Like it's just the natural thing. So if the great commandment, which is what this is called in Matthew 22, is all about who we are becoming, then Matthew 28, which is the great commission, is how we are to respond in the world around us. If, if who we are is becoming is the great commandment, it's a life full of love, then the natural overflow and outflow of that is to love the people around me, and that looks like Matthew 28, the great commission. Okay, if we live a great commandment life, then it naturally compels us to live a great commission life. Okay, we've talked about this from the very beginning, that this whole path of what it looks like to be a disciple does not end and terminate in me and myself and my relationship with God. It ultimately spills over into a sent life to impact the people around me. So now let's go to the great commission, Matthew 28. Again, you may be familiar with this passage. One of the last things Jesus says, he says this, then Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now I know we call this the great commission. It is, it's a commissioning. But what I want you to see is that this is not just a commissioning, this is a command. Now I know we call the great command, the great command, we call this the great commission, but this is very much, just as much of a command as the great commandment. Okay, this is the, this is the do part of what you and I are called to do. It's, it's not optional. There's nothing about this that screams the great option or the great suggestion, or the great, if you feel like it, would you please? No, this is very much Jesus' last words to his disciples. It's the command that he is sending them out to do something. And it's the same exact command that you and I have to be, that we have to pick up. It's the same exact challenge that you and I have in our everyday walk with Jesus Christ as, as a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's the same challenge we're called to pick up. I mean, the disciples, they were not out to try to just make converts. They were not just trying to make a bunch of decisions and to get a bunch of people saved and to check some boxes and to have some Christians. What they were doing as the disciples of Jesus is they were calling others to be discipled under them to apprentice after Jesus. This is the whole thing that you see all through the gospels and then spilling over into Acts and the rest of the New Testament is it did not stop in the gospels. The same thing just spilled over into their lives and to their followers and the people after them. Why? Because this was not an option to them. They were passionate about this to the point that they gave their lives for this. They gave their lives for this command that was given to them. Now, there are kind of four words here that I want to point out. These four words, go, make, baptize, and teach. And I'm pointing these out because what I want you to see is that, is that throughout all of this, there's only one command in the Great Commission. Okay, we look at this and there's four things here that it looks like we're to do. But what I want you to see and understand that there's actually only one command here. And the one command is make disciples. Everything else, go, baptize, and teach are all supporting that one command. 
And this is really, really important because I want you to understand that the, the, the chief goal, the chief thing that Jesus is sending us to do is this. And he's saying that as you go, it's going to look like you baptize people and then you teach them to obey all the ways that I've taught you. Right? This is what it's meant to look like. The command here is make disciples. This word go is a, pre, a present participle, which means it's ongoing and continuous. Okay, quick little grammar lesson there. So actually what this means, this word mean, this word go actually means going. It could easily be translated and it's probably better translated as, as you are going or while you are going. So think about it like this, while you are going, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to be making disciples. So as we go about life, as we go about every day of life, every, every, every sphere of life, everything that we're called into, whether it's family or it's work or it's whatever, extracurricular sports, whatever it is, as you go, Jesus is saying, listen, everywhere your feet goes, you're called to be making disciples. And what does that look like? Well, it looks like eventually you're gonna baptize them and then after that, you're gonna teach them how to obey the way that I've taught you. That's the command. If we were to really simplify the Great Commission, it would be this, disciples make disciples. Disciples make disciples, period. It's important for us to grab hold of that and understand that, that as an apprentice of Jesus, our life is meant to be teaching others how to apprentice to Jesus. Like it does not stop with us, it goes through us and it ultimately ends up impacting the people around us. We're called to make disciples. Now for me, and hopefully for you, this is really, really clear. Like there's, there, there's, there's just no way of kind of missing the, the, the life that a disciple is supposed to have, this make disciples kind of life. However, this whole series, we've been talking about how this is not happening in the world around us, right? Because we're surrounded by a bunch of people that call themselves Christians, but we would say they're not living a life of a disciple, right? So there's a lot of people in our country and our world that have missed out on what you and I as, as the body of Christ are called to do. Why is that? If it's, if it's so clear and it's so plain and it's right there and it's actually the words of Jesus and we love the words of Jesus, but sometimes the life and the way of Jesus, we don't necessarily like or wanna pick up, but well, we love to quote the words of Jesus. And every now and then we wanna do the works of Jesus, but we love, we love to hear about those big and amazing and miraculous and wonderful things. But when it comes down to the day in and day out way of life of Jesus, we kinda of go, ah, I'm gonna leave that to the pros. And this is very much the way that our culture is kind of set up. We don't, we don't live this way. Why is that? About, about five years ago, the company Barna, Barna Research, they asked a question, several thousand churchgoers. These are churchgoers. They didn't specify them as, as believers or non-believers. These are church-going people. They asked them this question. Have you ever heard of the Great Commission? This is wild to me. Only five years ago, have you ever heard of the Great Commission? 51% of churchgoers in America said no. I know you can't read that up there. It's too bright. But it says no, 51%. 50, 51% of churchgoing Americans have never even heard of the Great Commission. 25% said yes, but I can't recall the exact meaning. So just listen. So 76% from this study of church-going Americans do not either know what the Great Commission is or they don't understand it at all. And yet these were the final words to the church. These were the final words to you and I as the disciples of Jesus. This was the final command. Hey, listen, all of this stuff for three and a half years has been incredible. It's leading to this moment right here where you are called to go. And yet 70%, 76% of us don't know what that is. Isn't that wild? Why? 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 Why don't we live this thing out? Why don't we step into this? Why don't we understand this? There are a lot of different reasons, but I'm going to tell you what I think is probably the number one reason. 
I'm gonna tell you what I think is probably the number one reason over the last, specifically over the last 400 years, why the church has veered away from making disciples, okay? To do that, I'm gonna take you to Ephesians 4. There's a passage in Ephesians 4 where Paul is explaining to the church in Ephesus what a healthy church looks like, right? Gold mine, right? That's what we want. We want a healthy church. So Paul's literally saying, church in Ephesus, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna paint a picture for you what the church, a healthy church looks like. This is what he said. Ephesians 4, verse 11. Now these gifts, Christ Jesus gave to the church. So he's saying, listen, now we've talked about gifts of the spirit, right? Paul's saying, listen, there's gifts of the spirit, but I'm telling you right now that Jesus actually also gave some gifts to the church. And those gifts are apostles, prophets, evangelists, and the pastors and the teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. So here's what Paul's saying. If you want a healthy church, let me tell you what it looks like. It looks like every person, every disciple that's in that church doing the ministry of making disciples doing the ministry that Jesus Christ actually called us to do. He said, listen, I'm giving you some help. I'm giving you some leaders, some mentors. I'm giving you some people to equip you to do it. But ultimately, every disciple is called to do this. And when that happens, there's unity. Lord knows we need some of that. There's unity and the church is built up. But here's the problem. I don't know if you're aware of this. But sometimes punctuation is really important. You know what I mean? Like sometimes you can drop a period or a comma at the wrong place and mean something completely different. Or you can avoid a comma or a period or whatever at the wrong place and mean something completely different. For instance, this right here. Like, let's eat, Grandpa. But the moment you drop that comma, you got a problem, Grandpa. Right? I mean, we've got a very literal Hunger Games situation for grandpa. Right? Commas, punctuation matter. Here's one more just because we need to laugh. It's real heavy right now. This is a sign. We remember all who have served hot breakfast. (laughs) Praise the Lord for those that have served hot breakfast (laughs) and sacrificed their lives for the sake of a pancake or two. And then just one more, because again, we need to laugh. Here's one more for all you hunters. Hunters, please use caution when hunting pedestrians using the walk trails. (laughs) Okay, you can take that down because that's gonna be distracting. You get my point, right? So the lack of punctuation or the added unnecessary punctuation can cause a little bit of problems. Okay, this is to me how we can trace back this discipleship or this disciple making dilemma. We'll call it that. We can trace this back 400 years to the very first translation of the King James Version of the Bible. 1611, the first, I know, all y'all are grumbling already. Oh, don't, don't you come after the King James Version. I love the King James Version. Don't hear that at all. But what you're gonna see is you're gonna be able to see how this has happened over 400 years, how we have separated this theology and this understanding. Okay, the translation is incredible. It has its place, it's wonderful. Some of you guys, it's all you read and it's awesome. Okay, I'm not saying that whatsoever, but in 1611, actually seven years before 1611, 54 men were commissioned to create this translation. They did it in three different cities across England, Cambridge, Westminster, and Oxford. 54 people, three different committees, actually I think six different committees. Um, There's a seven year process, just this incredible thing, okay? Their, Their whole goal was to take the ancient Greek or Hebrew for the Old Testament, Greek for the New Testament, this ancient Greek and translate it into English so that you and I, the people then specifically, but you and I could understand it. But ancient Greek does not have punctuation. So what these men are doing is they're trying to add punctuation to help us understand the meaning of the text. 
Okay, so I'm gonna read the original 1611. Actually, it's not the original. I changed some of the words um, to more the, the current versions because they're just weird. The words are just weird. Um, and there were worse in 1611. There were some letter, uh, anyway, I don't wanna go there. Anyway, but I'm gonna show you the original, what it read in 1611, King James Version, that same passage. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, comma, for the work of ministry, comma, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, when you read that, just as thousands and thousands of Christians have done for four centuries now, you would walk away understanding that the job of a pastor is threefold, right? You would read that. The job of these gifts that Jesus gave the church, their job is threefold. It's to perfect you. Lord, help us. It's for the work of ministry and it's for the edifying of the body of Christ. Do you see it? What this communicates is that your job is just to eat and the guy on the stage's job is to really do the work of perfecting you and the work of the ministry and the work of building up the church. It's no wonder that there has been a massive chasm between pastors and people. Think about it. It's no wonder that for, and depending on the tradition you grew up in, even the tradition I grew up in, pastors were put up on a pedestal. They were closer to God than anybody else. They were more like Jesus. They had a direct line to Jesus. Like they were just this special, holy, set apart person and everybody else was just everybody else. But that is not the picture that Paul paints. That's not the picture of Jesus' life and the way he lived. Jesus didn't wear the garb the Pharisees wore. Jesus dressed like everybody else. Jesus taught like everybody else. He did life with everybody else. He spoke about things that matter, things that they need to hear. Like this is the way the disciples carried on. This is not the way Jesus lived whatsoever. But for years and years and years, this has painted a picture that, that the pastors are up here and everybody else is down here. And the pastors are the one that's ultimately supposed to build the church. It's the pastors that are supposed to make disciples. It's the pastors that are supposed to do the ministry. And this has gotten us to the point that we're at right now. It's us all not understanding our role and who God's called us to be. Some have called this the holy man myth. Okay, and Larry Osborne, he's a pastor in Southern California. He said this about the holy man myth. He said, the holy man myth is the idea that pastors and clergy somehow have a more direct line to God. It cripples a church because it overburdens pastors and it underutilizes the gifts and anointing of everyone else. It mistakenly equates leadership gifts with superior spirituality. This is not the way God called the church to operate. When Jesus said, go and make disciples, he didn't have a little caveat off to the side and said, oh, I'm only talking to a very select group of people. He said, no, no, every disciple, what's your job? It's to make disciples. It's to go and be in ministry and to do ministry. That is what we are called to do. Every single one of us is what we're called to do. The key word that I want you to kind of think back through in Ephesians 4, when Paul said it, he said the gifts that Jesus gave the church, the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, the teachers, the gifts that he gave the church are there to equip the people to do what? to actually do the work of the ministry. The key word there is the word equip. Because here's what I want you to see is that in your life, you are called to be pastoral in your life. You may not be called to equip everyone else to be pastoral, but in your life, in your business, in your home, you are very much called to be pastoral. It's our job as paid staff to teach you and equip you how to do that. It's our job, prophesying, prophesying. We've talked about this so much lately. It's not just for an elite select group of people. What's our job? Our job is to equip you, to teach you how to operate in the gifts of the prophetic in your everyday life in not weird ways, 
right? Like to evangelize. Evangelism is not just for a select group of people. No, no, no. God gave you gifts. Jesus gave the church gifts so that you could be equipped to evangelize the people in your circle. You may not be called to stand on a platform and equip others, but my friend, you are very much called to evangelize the people around you. Okay, that's who we're called to be. Okay, but I'm not, I'm not done. There's, there's even more to this passage. I'm literally editing my sermon in my mind right now because I have seven minutes left. <clears throat> but that's not all. Listen, Ephesians 4, let's go back to this verse again because there's more. There's more to this that I want you to see that's so important for the life of a disciple. All right, back to Ephesians 4, verse 12. This resp- their responsibility, again, the gifts that Jesus gave the church to equip, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until all come to such unity. So there's unity in the church, unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be made mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. So what's gonna happen whenever all of us are actually doing the work of ministry, the work of making disciples, the work that we're called to do, what's gonna happen? There's gonna be unity in the church. The church is gonna be built up. But look at this right here. This will continue until all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the Lord. That's a really big sentence. Because what Paul's saying is that as you go and make disciples, as you are going and doing the very thing you're called to do, you will mature in the Lord. You will mature in Christ's likeness. You will become like Jesus. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, I can't do that. I can't go. I can't evangelize. I can't, I can't share my faith. I can't, I can't be, do ministry because I'm not mature enough because I don't know enough of the Bible, because I've only, been a, I've only been a Christian so long, I don't know that I know enough. And what Paul's saying is that one of the paths to maturity is actually going. That as you go, as you pour out your life, the formation that we've been talking about is actually happening in your life. In other words, there are some parts of your Christ-like character that can only be formed as you go and make disciples, as you go and pour into someone else, as you go and serve with humility, as you go and lead with humility, as you go and actually live out the second half, this this overflow life that God's called us to live, it only happens when that is a reality in your life. Paul's saying, listen, your maturity is going to happen as you go. Look at the very next verse, verse 14. Then we will no longer be immature. So when this happens, when we as everyday people are actually living this out, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Do you you hear that? Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, of his body, the church. As we go, as we do the ministry he's called us to to do, as we make disciples, as we step out in faith and risk and do these things, then we grow. Every single disciple of Jesus Christ is called to make his final words our first work. We're all called to make disciples. Back in the year 2000, there were a couple of guys, um, I wanna say Jimmy and Larry were their two names. And if you remember, even back in the 90s and the 80s, there was this thing called the Britannica, the Encyclopedia Britannica, anybody remember that? These two guys, Jimmy and Larry, they had the idea, let's take the encyclopedia online. 
In the year 2000, they created Newpedia. I, I, I bet nobody remembers Newpedia. Newpedia was launched in 2000 by these two guys and they had this idea, let's create an online encyclopedia where anybody has access to the absolute best data, research, information about any topic. So they begin to reach out to PhDs and seminary professors and, and professors in colleges and universities. They begin to reach out to all these extreme kind of specialists in areas to try to get articles to populate Newpedia. Two and a half years in, they closed it because in two and a half years, they only had 21 articles. And this was a, 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 a big process, right? They had all these really important and special people. There was this editorial process. There was all this stuff going on to make this happen. Two and a half years, 21 articles. About a year into this process, these same two guys decided to start a side project called Wikipedia. <laughs> the purpose of Wikipedia was to help kind of bolster Newpedia. The whole idea behind Wikipedia was I'm gonna find, we're gonna find everyday passionate people to kind, of, to kind of help us farm for information, to kind of farm for the type of articles that we need. There was a really short kind of editorial process. They could get their articles up quick because it was ultimately gonna help these professionals produce these incredible articles on Newpedia, okay? Two and a half years into Newpedia, there were 21 articles. One year into Wikipedia, there were 20,000 articles. Today, Newpedia is long gone. Wikipedia today has 60 million articles. And the reason it has 60 million articles written in dozens and dozens of languages from all over the world is because they utilized everyday passionate people to write about everyday topics that they were passionate about. That's what changed it. What they did is they just, everyday people, hey, are you passionate about deep sea fishing? Would you write an article about deep sea fishing? Hey, are you passionate about salsa dancing? Write an article about the history of salsa dancing, right? Are you passionate about the 1611 version of the King James version of the Bible? Then write an article about that version of the Bible or what, whatever you're passionate about. And all of a sudden, everyday people began populating this website. Now there's 60 million articles. This is the picture of what the church is meant to look like. You lay that over the current church and what you see is a new PDA model in the church in America where it is run by and all the ministry is done, all the discipling is done, everything is done by a few trained professionals versus the Wikipedia model where it's every single person passionate about what God's called them to do. And when that happens, there's exponential growth. Every single person realizing that we are not only following Jesus, but we're becoming like him. We're empowered like him by the spirit to go and do the thing that he's called us to do, which is make disciples. And I know for some of you, this seems really overwhelming. You're just like, man, I don't even know. Like, this just seems so big. I thought this was your job. I ain't even thinking about this at all, bro. <laughs> like, you just hit me with something heavy. Listen, don't be overwhelmed. As a church, this is the path that we're on right now. This is where God's been taking us. And over this year, you're gonna hear and see a whole lot more of what God's been doing behind the scenes a whole lot more of what God is, is kind of stirring up in me and what he's beginning to stir up in some of you. Some of you are saying words to me that you don't realize how impactful they are and how meaningful they are whenever you say, I just love the vision of our church. I just love where we're going. I know what you mean, but I know a lot more than what you think you know. <laughs> Right, like you're in a spiritual level, you're, con you're connecting with something God is doing. And I'm telling you, there's some beautiful and amazing things God is unrolling and that are happening right now. And there will come a time over the next few months, I promise you that. So don't get overwhelmed. Don't think, oh my goodness, I can't, I don't even know where to start. We're gonna help. You know, we're called to equip, we're called to do this. So we're, we're in this thing with you, but I want you to understand that the way of a disciple, it leads to making disciples. Every single one of us making disciples. Disciple making is both evangelism and discipleship, by the way. Like whenever I say disciple making, we talk about making disciples, don't think it's just discipleship or it's just evangelism. They are actually both a part of the same continuum of disciple making. 
Because if we're a church that all we focus, is, focus on is evangelism, then we end up very, very wide and only an inch deep. But if all we do is focus on discipleship, then we get really, really deep. We get a mile deep and only an inch wide. That's not who God's called us to be. Disciple making is both reaching the lost and then training them, teaching them how to be an apprentice of Jesus, how to live and walk and become like Jesus. Now I had a whole ending thing here with some practical points. I'm gonna skip every bit of it. Okay, because I think I've given you enough for today. I wanna end this way. Again, let me, just, let me just say it one more time. Don't be overwhelmed. Don't be overwhelmed. God's leading us somewhere. We're gonna trust him to continue leading us somewhere. But I wanna take you back two weeks ago when Pastor Wayne was here. Standing right here, he spoke a word over our church. And I don't, I don't wanna take the time to read the whole thing over again. You can go back and you can watch it if you want to. But there was one paragraph in what he read. Um, now, knowing just a little bit of what you know and me just kind of teasing what's coming, I want you to see how important this is of what he said and spoke from the Spirit of God over our house. Look at what he said. It is time for this house to personally re-embrace the go ye in your commission as believers. Sharing our faith is not only for gifted evangelists, it is every believer's call to show and tell the good news of the kingdom. Cry out to God and the Holy Spirit will empower you in a fresh way to be his witnesses. And the Lord will help you extend your message of hope beyond where he has been heard before from neighborhoods to nations. Just as Jesus began to do and teach, the Holy Spirit is inserting hope through what you do as well as what you say. For him to say, just as Jesus began to do and teach, Only God. It's literally what we've been talking about. And the beginning of this whole prophetic word, and again, I wasn't gonna even mention it, but the beginning of this prophetic word talks about enlarge your tent. Prepare. Enlarge your tent, why? Because when we get this, we will be the church that we're called to be. Well, we understand what it means to live out the character of Jesus Christ and to be transformed into his, into his life and his characteristics and his heart. And when that spills over, what God's doing on the inside of us begins to spill over into the people's lives all around us. Whenever they begin to sense what he's doing and then we invite and we open up our lives and we share our faith and we do all these things, we begin to disciple them. We bring them alongside of us and we begin to disciple them in the way of Jesus. That's what the New Testament church looks like. And that's who we're called to be. That's the kind of church that we're called to be. Where every single one of us realizes you're not just here to warm a seat. As amazing as worship is, you're not just here to come and enjoy worship. As awesome as your small group is and you've come to love those people and you eat great food together and you hang out together, it's so much more than that. And guys, God has not called us to be a church that just keeps doing the same old thing, the same old way, just checking some boxes. There's a lot of lost people in our communities that need the love and the hope of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, go and make disciples. As you are going about your life, make disciples. Share your faith. Lead obediently. Share your faith and lead in such a way that you're not only teaching them the teachings of Jesus, but you're showing them how to live them out. He said, that's who we're called to be. Disciples of Jesus, disciple people. What if we were to be the kind of church that made his final words our first work? What if, what if for us it was all about that? 
in your personal life, your goal, your heart wasn't about more money or more happiness or more success or more satisfaction or that everybody would like you, but the goal of your heart would be to do the very thing he put in front of you to do, to go and make disciples. Let's pray. Jesus, we just thank you for this challenge today. And Lord, I pray that it was received with kind of open hearts and open hands, fertile soil. God, that the word of your, that your word, God, would sink deep into our hearts and it would be something that we sit and we chomp on and we chew on and we, God, we allow your words to sink deep into our heart. We don't just run on to the next thing. But God, that there would be a conviction, there would be a passion, there would be something in us, God, that we would truly want to make your final words our first work. God, we love you, and I thank you for what you've done today in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you're leaving this experience excited, inspired by what God is doing in your life. And look, maybe you're ready to take a step. It could look like a decision to follow Jesus or getting prayer for something that's going on in your life, or maybe it's just getting connected to our church and growing in community with other believers. We want to give you the opportunity to take that step right now. So look, there's a QR code coming up on your screen. Follow that link and let us connect with you. Because here's what we know. Watching or, or consuming content by itself is never going to do it when it comes to finding the life that God has for you. So we'd love to connect with you, get to know you a little bit more, but ultimately, let's grow together. Let's be a part of the church. And we can't wait to see you next time right here at City Hope Church.